Namaste, welcome to Kantipur Rise and Shine. I'm Prativa Tulader. Climate change is a term we hear so often these days, and as the temperatures soar in different parts of the world because of global warming, people's livelihoods are being challenged anywhere in the world. Climate change has occupied the world debate for several years now, yet there seems to be a wide gap between scientists, policy makers, and the public when it comes to this issue. On Kantipur Rise and Shine today, we will speak with Mr. Pramod Kumar Agarwal. Mr. Agarwal is Regional Program Leader for South Asia for Consultative Group on International National Agriculture Research Cigar Program on Climate Change, Agriculture and Food Security. Mr. Agarwal is also National Professor at the Indian Agricultural Research Institute in New Delhi and has developed a broad range of innovative strategies to examine the potential impact of global warming on agriculture, especially in India. And as one of India's leading climate change experts, Mr. Agarwal has served as the coordinator of a government-sponsored national network designed to quantify the sensitivity on crops, forests, livestock, and fisheries to global climate change. Comprised of 150 scientists from 23 universities and research centers, the network has been a major source of capacity building for addressing climate change challenges in his native country. He is currently in Kathmandu to share his expertise at a two-day workshop on climate change, agriculture and food security. Welcome to our show, Mr. Agarwal. Thank you. We hear so much about climate change now and there are different government agencies and non-government agencies taking up the issue and it seems like it gets more and more uh, talked about in a very um, te technical way, but how would you describe climate change to a farmer, let's say in rural Nepal? Yeah, well climate is an issue that everybody needs to be concerned with, you know, whether it's a farmer, or it's a government servant or an individual citizen, they all need to be very much concerned about climate change. So it's very important for everybody to understand in common language what exactly is climate change. So if I have to explain to a farmer, which we often do because we work with farmers largely, is that uh, how the weather is changing, you know, how in recent past temperatures have increased, how frequency of rainfall is changing or how intensity of rainfall is changing and that farmers are easily able to relate to. And they're also able to relate to that, yes, these changes are likely to continue in future. And that's what exactly is climate change. That why these changes in temperature, rainfall intensity, rainfall frequency are taking place, that's what is exactly climate change. Um, so, so you said that they're able to understand it in terms of the impact it's having on the work they do. Um, I'm wondering, is agriculture also contributing to um, climate change, global warming? Yeah, that's an interesting point. But you see, first we have to understand that agriculture does impact, agri uh, climate change does impact agriculture significantly. You know, any change in temperature, any change in precipitation directly affects plant growth and as a consequence crop yields are affected. Farmers are noticing some of these changes for quite some time. Uh, for example, on apples, there's a big impact on apples, temperatures in hilly areas have gone up and as a consequence, apple belt has shifted up in India as well as in Nepal. So that's a significant change that farmers have been observing. Similarly, you can also observe changes in fisheries, in livestock. So all these things are happening. But it is very interesting to understand that climate change is caused not only by emissions from industrial sector, but also to some extent by agriculture. Most of us often don't realize, but agriculture does contribute to climate change. Uh, globally, on average, about 13% of total emissions come from agriculture. And if you add forestry sector and land use change, another 17%. So roughly one third of total emissions come from agriculture and land use changes. In developing countries like ours, in South Asia, especially in the context of Nepal, India, Pakistan, emissions from agriculture sector are still larger because we are primarily agriculture-based economy. A large fraction of our GDP still comes from agriculture. So the contribution of agriculture to emissions from on these countries is significant. So you said um, agriculture emissions, can we explain that in a simpler way? How would I, for instance, who doesn't know much about climate change or agro emissions, understand a thing yeah. like that? You see, there, there's several plant species, for example, rice uh, that we all eat every day. Uh, rice paddies, when they're flooded, they're generally flooded. Mm -hmm. So when they're flooded, bacteria in the soils uh, emit a particular gas called methane, and methane causes climate change. It's a very potent greenhouse gas and that leads to warming of the temperature. 
So it traps heat in the atmosphere and as a consequence temperature goes up. Similarly, nitrous oxides, you know, what fertilizers that we apply, the organic matter that we apply to soils, the manures that we apply to soils and soils basic fertility leads to emissions of nitrous oxide. And nitrous oxide is still worse in terms of its heat trapping potential. So, and when we do deforestation, again, a lot of carbon dioxide is released. Mm -hmm. And we have this livestock, you know, we all love our milk, uh, curd, yogurt, and milk products. Mm -hmm. But I think most people don't understand that uh, these livestock have a rumen in their digestive system. When they digest their food, methane is produced, and in a very significant quantity. So all of these gases, when they go to the atmosphere, they trap heat, and as a consequence, temperature rises. Uh, in particular, livestock is a very significant contributor in South Asia. Mm -hmm. So, sir, um, we are all contributors to climate change in our own ways. Um, how is the impact of climate change, um, if you look at South Asia as a scientist, how do you see its impact on South Asia in particular? So South Asia is in fact, there are several studies which have shown that South Asia in fact is the most vulnerable region in the world for a variety of reasons. First, because of its uh, inherent uh, climatic variability. We have large climatic variability, especially in parts of Pakistan, in southern India, and also in Bangladesh, so there's large climatic variability. As a consequence, we even today experience lots of droughts, floods, cyclones, so, and heat episodes. These are very common even today. And above all, our adaptive capacity is rather limited because we have a very high population base with limited income. So they're very vulnerable population even today. So as climate change progresses, in the sense as more droughts or more floods, which is manifestation of climate change, start occurring, then this region is likely to become even more vulnerable. So overall, several studies have shown that South Asia is a very major hotspot of climate change, and we really need to address it. And that's why we're trying to focus a lot that how best we can improve the adaptive capacity of our farmers in South Asia. So, so how are you working um, in terms of uh, bringing regional farmers or policy makers together because um, I looked at your program and one of your objectives is to bridge the gap between policy makers, scientists and farmers and to bring the yeah. issue of climate change to a simple yeah. level. Yeah, that's an important point. You see, over time what we realize, we have been doing this climate change research for some time, but what we realize is that the message of the scientists is often not reaching the end user. And mm -hmm. for us, there are two types of end user. One is farmer on one side, on the other side is policy maker. Mm -hmm. Both really need a lot of capacity building in terms of understanding what is climate change, what are likely impacts, what farmers should do, what policy makers to, should do. So science that way was not really percolating down to uh, some of our stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So what we have done recently, we have made a climate smart learning platform for South Asia. This is a platform for knowledge exchange uh, among scientists, with farmers, with policy makers, with NGOs, with industry. So everybody can share their experiences with each other. And I th we feel that that will be really very useful for all of us to learn much more about climate change, how it impacts agriculture, and how agriculture in turn impacts climate change. This is the regional learning platform that uh, you yes. hope to launch today. Um, it's called Climate Smart Agriculture Platform. Right, learning platform. Learning platform. I'm just wondering in terms of uh, the logistics, how does the platform work? How do you bring people together from different yeah. parts of the country? See, in this platform, there are two ways that we shall be approaching. One is we will is be issuing a quarterly e-newsletter, mm -hmm. which will go to all of our uh, database, you know, so everybody will receive that e-newsletter. Plus, uh, very frequently we organize meetings, you know, with farmers, with policy makers. For example, today we are meeting in Nepal uh, with a group of farmers, with a group of policy makers, a group of parliamentarians, because they also need to be very sensitized at what exactly is climate change and how they can help their own country in building climate smart agriculture practices. So by this increased dialogue among all these stakeholders, we hope that uh, we will be able to address climate change issues somewhat better. Um, you've been working in different parts of South Asia and you've been working in Rupandehi in Nepal. Uh, what kind of experiences did you gather when you went down to the level of the farmers to talk about climate change issues? Um, was it 
easy, difficult yeah, to explain yeah, it to yeah. them? Was it difficult to bring together policymakers and farmers? Can you share some of your experience? Yeah, sure. Uh, see, we, ha we do work in Bangladesh, we work in Sri Lanka, we work in India, we work in Nepal, we also do work in Pakistan, you know, so we practically work in all countries of South Asia here. And one thing what uh, I have always noticed, that farmers are fairly well educated about this, in the sense in, they may not be using the standard language of climate change that we scientists or others use, but in their own understanding, they are very clear that something is happening with their climatic system. It is not same temperature as it used to be, it is not same rainfall frequency that used to be, so they are, and they also know that they are getting affected. For example, in Bangladesh, where I was recently, farmers are very aware that cyclone intensity has increased, you know, so they see far more cyclones than what were happening earlier. Here, when I go to Rupendahi, farmers are clear that there is a distinct change in rainfall patterns. Now, they are not always able to quantify, but we did this survey in Rupendahi and also in other places about farmers perception about climate change. And we were very happy to note that farmers' perception to a large extent matched with the observed data that how temperatures have been changing and how precipitation has been changing. So farmers do understand. So that, that's not an issue. They do understand, but often they're not very clear how to communicate about it and what exactly they can do. So we hope with this uh, learning platform that we're launching today, that should become feasible. So I uh, fell from some of uh my interactions with people who are recipients of, you know, like direct recipients of um, changes in the climate that um, they are aware in their own ways, like you said, of what is happening. Like they know there's this change in rainfall pattern and they know their crops are not, uh, like there is some impact in the way their crops are growing. But it also seems like uh, they're somehow resigned to the faith because um, this region being a more, uh, you know, like, you think this is how it is and sometimes you tend to um, blame the gods and their anger for these things. How do you deal with things like that on that level? Yeah, well, farmers have a number of perceptions, as we all understand in this region. They have their own beliefs uh, in supernatural powers sometimes, but that's, leaving aside that, farmers are very smart. I, I, for one, differ very much that farmers don't understand. Farmers do understand a lot. In fact, there's a lot that others can learn from farmers. They are practical people. They have been doing farming for ages. They have seen their fathers, grandfathers do that. So they understand agriculture very well. They understand climatic systems very well. The only key concern is that they are not able to communicate that better and since they're relatively poor uh, within society so their voice is often not heard of so I think this platform that we are launching will certainly help raise their voice you know, and for that's one of the major goals that we have to raise the voice of farmers to a level that policymakers can understand policymakers also are sensitized about it but they are also not very clear because we scientists often talk in a standard mm -hmm. uh, language you know which is often not very well understood by policymakers as well mm -hmm. so they're also keen to understand this problem better that what exactly can they do and especially since climate change as you know is not not only a science issue but also economic issue, also a political issue, so politicians and policy makers also need to understand it better. Uh, but also very important is that farmers can also learn from each other. It's not that they will be only scientists have to explain. The farmers can learn from each other. For example, in Rupendahi, we have started this project where what we are trying to understand and trying farmers to understand that climate of tomorrow already existed someplace today, mm -hmm. right? So what they will experience 20 years from now already exists some other place, say X place. So what we are trying to do is to get these farmers of Rupendahi experience that climate that is likely to be in Rupendahi 20 years from now and learn from the farmers there that what exactly they are doing today which can help them in improving their livelihoods, adapting agriculture better tomorrow. So there are a number of things that farmers can learn from each other. I think that's something mm -hmm. again not very well done but we are trying to promote that mm -hmm. as well. That sounds like a very interesting yeah. interaction. Yeah. Uh, how about in terms of uh, what we have as technical support and research, how does that help farmers now that there's so much being done in this sector? Yeah. 
See, what we have a project called Climate Smart Village. Mm -hmm. So in basically what we are trying to do is to how to make the agriculture very smart, smart in the sense, you know, that how to make it very adaptive, more productive, because in South Asia we still need to produce a lot. You know, we can be climate resilient, but unless we produce more, we will not be able to feed our population, which mm -hmm. is still growing significantly. So by Climate Smart, basically what we mean is that an agriculture that is productive, that is intensive, but yet is contributing minimal to greenhouse gas emissions, which mm -hmm. is one of the causes of worry. Uh, so this is what we're trying to promote. And there are a number of ways we can do it. One very important thing is water management. You know, how exactly we should manage our water resources. Today, because power uh, pricing policy of water is somewhat uh, not appropriate, so farmers often use a lot of water, more than what they require. Mm -hmm. So how to make uh, them do water management better, how to recharge their aquifers because this in plains certainly that is becoming a problem, how to manage crop residues, you know, because that crop residues once you, uh, if you burn them, they cause a lot of emission. So we are trying to teach farmers what exactly they can do with their residues, how they can use it to enrich soil fertility, how they can use it to generate energy through biogas and other means. Similarly about uh, insurance. Mm -hmm. So these are relatively new risk management strategies, the index-based insurance where farmers uh, will be insuring against rainfall or against temperature increase, not directly against crop loss. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the strategies that we are trying to propagate as part of Climate Smart Village mm -hmm. concert that we have launched all over South Asia. So you're hoping to promote insurance in Nepal also, which does not exist so far. Can, you, can we go a bit into how that works for farmers' insurance? Yeah, right. You see, uh, we all understand general insurance, you mm -hmm. know, our houses are insured, often our cars, our automobiles are generally insured. So we understand, you know, general public understands insurance reasonably well. Uh, but uh, there's other form of insurance which is rural insurance, especially crop insurance. I understand crop insurance is still not common in Nepal, but in all other South Asian countries it has become fairly common. So basically what is done here is uh, that you pay premium, like you pay premium for your cars, and then uh, in case there's some damage you get some compensation. Same way here, if there's a crop loss, then you get compensation for that. This is done by insurance companies who are largely supported by government. But there's more advanced form of insurance, which is relatively more transparent and <coughs> very useful, that we call index-based insurance. Mm -hmm. In that, basically, instead of insuring crop loss, which is often very difficult to estimate, and mm -hmm. we have difficulties in explaining to farmers, you know, and farmers have their own arguments how much exactly they've lost. These schemes are much simpler. Here, instead of crop, we insure rainfall, for example. Mm -hmm. So what happens uh, based on a given rainfall station, we say, okay, if the rainfall goes below a critical threshold, then farmers will start receiving payments. Mm -hmm. So and if the temperature goes above a critical threshold, which is predetermined, then farmers will start receiving payment. So this, has, this scheme has many advantages. It is more transparent, mm -hmm. payments are quick, and the farmers can themselves see what sort of changes are happening, play, right. are happening today. Mm -hmm. So this is a scheme that we will now start trying in Nepal as well. So we shall be talking to the government here. We we'll, shall be talking to the insurance agencies to explore how best this can be implemented. So you're here. saying that the government should support uh, insurance programs because it seems that uh, insurance companies <coughs> are not very keen because it's not a lucrative business for them. Yeah, in, in general, rural insurance, as we understand, is not going to be that simple, but the transaction costs for insurance companies are also going to be large, especially in mountainous country like Nepal, where farmers live sometimes in remote areas, it is somewhat difficult for insurance companies. So most often in many countries, insurance, crop insurance and weather-based insurance is supported by the government. You know, so government will have to come in between. I come from India, there also we have uh, very major mm -hmm. schemes of insurance, they are largely supported by government. So we are hoping, and today when we have this discussion, we shall be talking to the government people we shall be talking to insurance companies as well to see how best this scheme can be launched in Nepal. Mm. With that hope, we'll um, end this conversation here for today. Thank you very much, Mr. Agora, for joining us on our show. Thank it's you. been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We were speaking to Mr. Pramod Kumar Agarwal, who is an environmental scientist, and he'll be sharing his expertise at a two-day conference, uh, at a two-day workshop on climate change, agriculture, and food security in Nepal. Um, which will be happening in Kathmandu today and tomorrow. Coming up next is Kantipur News, so please stay tuned.